All right, good. Let's uh, get started. Uh, the recording, yeah, the recording has also started. Okay, good. Um, welcome everybody, both the people in the room and also the people at home. Uh, we're here together today for the lecture by neutrality, normalization, politicization, polarization, radicalization, four big words covering almost anything relevant nowadays in politics and philosophy. So great to have you. Before we get started and before I give the floor to my dear colleague and friend, Jeroen Leder, to properly introduce our speaker, I'd like to uh, let you know that this is a lecture in the Extreme Beliefs uh, lecture series, and uh, that we're having another one on the 21st of March. So check the website, www.extremebeliefs.com, uh, on the 21st of March by Peter Nonnenga, and then also a workshop on extreme beliefs and subjectivity with keynote speakers such as Kasim Kasson, Karen Douglas, uh, Paul Katsavanas and Naomi Close with those four actually, and also other speakers in the parallel session. So if you're interested in those matters, please look it up. And now let me give the floor to yep. the dinner. Great. There you go. Well, let me move in front of the camera. Um, so welcome everyone here and everyone online. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Oliver Trolley from the United States, uh, where he is a postdoctoral fellow, research fellow at the James Madison program at Princeton University. Um, he has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame, and his research is in epistemology, focusing on questions about the nature of epistemic norms and the epistemology of the social world, uh, political epistemology, the epistemology of politics. And I should mention his forthcoming book, uh, of course, it's entitled Political Beliefs, uh, a philosophical introduction. It's forthcoming in two months from now, three months, May? Uh, yeah, two and a half or so. Pretty soon. Uh, I can highly recommend it having reviewed it. Uh, so I know everything that's in there. Well, you know, in the like penultimate version. <laughs> um, but it really is a great book. So it's creative, it's fascinating, it's chock full of ideas. Um, it draws on epistemology, but it also draws on political science and psychology. So it's very well empirically informed, highly recommended, if you ask me. Um, and actually, I should also say something about how I sort of came to know Oliver Trolley because he is also a very enthusiastic and prolific contributor to what you might call public philosophy. I don't know if you call it that, but... <laughs> um, so he writes a lot, and I really mean a lot of book reviews and op-ed pieces, essays on cultural criticism, applying philosophy, the tools of epistemology to um, the contemporary world, mostly in the US. but. Um, one thing I appreciate so much about his writing is, uh, well, not just that it's witty, it's informed, but also um, in many ways he sometimes or often goes against what might be sort of mainstream consensus in left-leading academia. Is that fair? That's very fair. That's very fair. Uh, but instead of uh, reverting to ridicule or cynicism or these sorts of bad moves, uh, I think his criticisms are always fair. They're well-informed, they're careful. Uh, so he really sort of goes for the arguments and not the people. And I appreciate that about him very much. So without further ado, let me give the floor to Oliver. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks Rick for having me. Thanks everybody for being here. I don't know if I'm, now I'm visible. That's yeah. good. It's good to be visible. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, thanks for saying such nice things about the book. Uh, I think uh, this talk, uh, maybe has some of the virtues and vices of the book. Um, it's a little bit disorganized. Uh, I was thinking how that how it relates to the book. Um, there, there's this paper uh, Jonathan Bennett wrote uh, about believing it will, which he he he, he meant to find the, the knockdown argument against dioxastic voluntarism. Here's the final reason why we can't believe it will, and he just didn't come up with it. So he called he so he he called the paper, uh, and it's actually a great paper, but he called it a record of failure. Um, because it's sort of him going through all the arguments he thought would work and the arguments other people had given. Um, and in some ways, you know, I think uh, the book also is a lot of people who aren't in philosophy, when I told them about the book, they said, okay, so, you know, it's called political beliefs. What is your theory of political beliefs? What is the final theory of political beliefs? Well, I mostly explained why a lot of the things that other people thought about political beliefs and things I thought about political beliefs before writing the book turned out not to be completely convincing to me. Um, yeah, as Rick said, this talk is called Normalization, Politicization, Polarization, Radicalization. It does basically cover everything, uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to cover everything. Um, hopefully, I have some interesting things to say about normalization in particular. Um, 
I've also realized uh, I've been in Europe for about two weeks now and talking about these issues with people um, on purpose and also by accident. You know, it turns out people will talk to you about politics just even if you think you're not about to. Um, <laughs> so I'll probably talk about polarization as well because it's uh, increasingly realizing that's a phenomenon characteristic of American political epistemology, but maybe not of, of European political epistemology in the same way. Um, but yeah, it's probably a bad title. I'm not going to define all these words for you or anything like that. I'm more interested in how do they relate to each other? Are there differences between them? Not at the level of what they do, but sort of at a more structural level. I'll tell, I'll tell you more about what I mean in a minute. Um, and I also want to think a little bit more about the goals of political epistemology itself, um, what we're able to do with it, maybe some of what the challenges are um, in, the same, in the same way that epistemology always has challenges. Um, Okay, so that's more than enough introduction. Okay, well, okay, so what I just said, I'm going right into it. I forgot how I organized these slides. So some background worries. Um, first background worry is, epistem is political epistemology just politics? Um, so I'm putting this very strongly, but uh, there's a background worry that we have to build our, our political beliefs into the way we do political epistemology. Uh, that's kind of from the academic side of it, from the public side of it. The reverse of that is Turns out a lot of non-academics do political epistemology all the time in the sense that part of disagreeing with people about politics often gives an account of, it often involves giving an account of where you think their beliefs came from, right? So explaining the processes that you think formed your opponent's beliefs uh, is a big part of political discourse. Um, we wanna make sure I think in political epistemology, political psychology, uh, that we're not just doing this, right? That we're not just saying uh, you know, I don't like your belief, and now I'm going to kind of give a negative characterization of how you came up with it. Um, similarly, will every political group have its own political epistemology? Say more about this later, um, but you might think uh, if you have different starting points, different epistemic starting points, and they seem kind of as certain to you as many people's political beliefs seem to them, uh, that our explanations of the phenomenon of forming political beliefs might differ so much uh, between political groups. Um, um, yeah, that, that we might not have a, you know, we might not be able to agree on, on, on political epistemology, right? So if we disagree about politics, we might end up disagreeing about political epistemology. Maybe that's not as bad about, not as bad as disagreeing about politics to begin with, but it's bad for the project of political epistemology, right? Um, and then similarly is explaining political disagreement a way of not taking it seriously, right? So if I, if I say, Here's the process, you know, I'm doing my political epistemology, I'm positing a process by which you came up with your belief. Um, maybe it's a way of kind of diagnosing you, a way of diagnosing your belief rather than a, a way of saying, you know, you probably have reasons and form this belief in a normal way. Now I say you probably have, you know, a disorder and form this belief in a crazy way, right? <laughs> so if that's what we're doing at some point, we probably don't want to do that. Um, but again, thinking of coming about this from the American context, which I understand is you're thinking about different issues there. Um, yeah, so fourth bullet point here, there's some overlap between these. Um, is it possible to even get started in projects in political epistemology without assessing the strength of our political evidence? Um, I'll talk more about this later. Um, and then last one, how do we decide which people's political beliefs have undergone a process which merits the sort of scrutiny of political epistemology, right? Um, so one thing that, that we see a lot uh, in the in the literature everywhere, I think, on political beliefs is there, there's a set of political beliefs that we think merit particular scrutiny. Conspiracy theory is a great example, right? Um, so we think, well, you have a theory that there's this, this political conspiracy. Um, and for that reason, you know, we have to posit some elaborate process by which you form this belief. Um, I have a theory that, you know, Capitalism is amazing and liberal democracy is the best form of government. Nobody needs to explain why I have my belief, right? It's just, that's like a normal belief, you know, that there, there couldn't possibly end, you know, maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, but I'm not like weird for having it, right? Um, so we'll talk more about that. Um, so there's a question of who's called weird and therefore merits a certain kind of scrutiny. Um, so this is, again, this is just the, the record of worries, the record of failure, uh, things that I think are difficult for political technology. Um, so yeah, so thinking about processes, um, in, uh, in preparing for this, I was trying to figure out what extreme beliefs are, 
Um, luckily, I talked to Rick a little earlier. He told me I don't need to know that uh, to be here. Uh, so I was able to stay and give this talk. Um, is everything okay? Yeah, I stopped sharing the screen. Oh, okay, yeah. Doing that again. Um, and, and maybe full screen as well. Um, or it doesn't matter. Okay, doesn't matter. This is, I think this is fine. Okay. okay. Thanks, Gary. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. It's, um, it's, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, right. So processes matter in political epistemology. Um, to prepare for this, I was doing some reading of Rick's papers and some other writing on extreme beliefs and extremism. Came across uh, Kwasim Kassam's book uh, on the philosophy of extremism. Um, and uh, right, I think on the very first page, um, he says this. I, I don't think he necessarily sticks with this. I'm sure he nuances it a bit. Uh, maybe he ends up disagreeing with it. But he says he was familiar with the standard definition of radicalization as the process of becoming an extremist. So that's an interesting notion. Um, that an extremist is somebody who's gone through a certain process, right? Um, so again, you can be kind of born normal and become an extremist. Uh, you can't be born an extremist, right? Um, of course, there could be a de-radicalization process, but that's sort of from the perspective of, you know, already having gone through a process. And of course, we, you know, having undergone a process that doesn't need to be such a big deal, um, but but it's a question about what we're paying attention to in political epistemology. So that's the sort of concern that I have here. So why does becoming an, an extremist require a process? Um, why does getting more normal political beliefs not necessarily require a process? Um, maybe it just requires normal normal epistemology, right? Rather than political epistemology, normal perception, um, you know, evaluating evidence uh, that doesn't require special scrutiny, right? Um, and there's a more general question, and this is something that I came up against when I was reading psychological accounts of, uh, of political beliefs um, as I was writing those sections of the book. Um, you know, in epistemology, we're, we're worried about rationality and irrationality, right? Um, so those are normative notions um, without necessarily big descriptive components. In psychology, often they're, they're worried about notions that maybe more blend normative and descriptive, right? So normalcy and deviance, um, obviously those have normative sounds, um, but you might also think that uh, the starting point for normalcy is sort of what people tend to do, and the starting point of deviance is when people deviate from that tendency, right? Um, so there's a general question about uh, how does the psychology relate to the epistemology? Um, I don't know why I put this at the bottom here, but yeah, a little signposting. Um, I'm going to end up talking about uh, philosophy of history um, as a way of addressing some of these processes or as something that we need to engage in to address these processes. Um, okay, so normalization, one of the things that I have in my title, um, one of the processes that I think is, is cool to talk about, um, interestingly, hasn't been talked about that much. So in the US, again, different context, but in the US, political epistemology and philosophy really kind of blew up uh, starting around uh, the election of Donald Trump, um, in part because notions of political epistemology were in sort of public discourse. Um, so somebody in the Trump White House uh, used the phrase alternative facts um, in a press conference. Uh, obviously, that uh, had some sort of uh, epistemic you know, she into it. How can one fact be alternative to another, right? Um, there was a lot of talk about, you know, post-truth era, relativism, things like that. Uh, uh, Ty and Ginn had, had his great paper on echo chambers and epistemic bubbles. People were worried a lot about filter bubbles on the internet, social media bubbles. Um, and of course, there were conspiracy theory worries, as there always are. Um, but this notion of normalization didn't quite get an epistemic treatment. So I have some, I have an image here. This is actually recent. So these are, we're normalizing Trump again. Trump is normalizing violence. Don't normalize, you know. Um, one interesting thing about this word norm normalization, there was already a word normalization that means something different than this. So for example, if two countries normalize relations, uh, it means they're not acting weird anymore, right? Um, so that's a change in the world where something, something weird goes to being something normal. This is a change in our heads 
where we go from treating something as being weird to treating it as being normal. Um, I think that's, a, that's an important difference because it's a difference between two kinds of processes, which is the sort of difference I'm concerned with here, right? And I think it's worth thinking about, and here's, here's a quote from Matt Iglesias, but it, yeah, don't worry about it too much. Um, it's worth thinking about here because I think there's a question about what aspect of our political beliefs uh, makes it the case that some political phenomenon has been normalized or not? Is that a normalization something that acts on our political beliefs? Does it act on a political belief space? Um, yeah, I'll talk more about that. Um, another issue that, that got me into thinking about this stuff is the asymmetric polarization in de debate in the United States. So, okay, just talking about polarization a little bit, Really, they have to do this different context, right? In the US, we have two major political parties and basically everything in politics is defined by its relationship to those parties, right? If you have a third party, it's like the little sibling of, of, of the big parties, right? Um, so our Green Party is like the annoying little sibling of the Democratic Party, Democratic Social, Socialists of America, that's like even more annoying little sibling of the Democratic Party, right? So everything radiates out from our, uh, from the two parties. And in fact, some of the best theories of political beliefs that are operative in the United States have something to do with everybody just follows the parties and you know our identities are caught up in the parties. Um, there's this phenomenon Robert Talese talks about called political saturation. Um, I often just call it politicization, uh, where even things that you know don't have, have to do with our political beliefs don't really have to do with politics become associated with the two parties. So for example, a classic one, well, where you live, obviously, what kind of car you drive, you know, whether it's an environmentally efficient or not, what sports you watch, um, uh, where you get your coffee. So Starbucks is for Democrats and Dunkin' Donuts is for Republicans. Um, <laughs> you probably have better donuts than Dunkin' Donuts here, um, but it's a donut chain in the United States and bagels. Um, so, even the asymmetric polarization debate is polarized in the United States in that both sides blame the other side for the polarization, right? Um, and this kind of makes sense. If you think of polarization, which I think is actually not the most interesting way to think about it, but these charts are thinking about polarization as the gr groups going further away from each other in one sense or another, right? So becoming more extreme. So does that have something to do with extreme political beliefs? Um, on the right, we have a chart of some complicated political science measure called DW nominate, which has to do with how, how different members of the parties vote with each other in Congress. This chart is often cited to say, well, look, we have, we have different lines. The Democrats are staying the same and the Republicans are the ones who are becoming more polarized. Not actually a convincing chart. I can get into that later. Um, on the left, you have a sort of like a, anti-woke, anti-social justice account of who's responsible for polarization, right? So Colin, he says, uh, here we were, you know, I was liberal. Then as time went on, I didn't change, but somehow I was changed, right? Again, interesting notion of what sort of process we have acting on people's political beliefs, right? So he was changed from being left-wing to right-wing by the passage of time, right? The mere passage of time turned him from a left winger to a right winger. This is this is a notion that is all over right wing thought, but it doesn't rarely touched on, on in political epistemology. But you know, William F. Buckley, the the founder of National Review, one of the one of the conservative magazines uh, in the United States, he said that the job of the conservative is to to stand up for history and yell stop. So basically, you know, for him, conservatism is intimately related to the philosophy of history. And the notion that maybe we aren't making progress, right? Um, on the other hand, this isn't so satisfying either. Now, why not? I probably have this on a further slide, but why isn't it so satisfying? Well, you might think we have to think harder about why did the other person change and you not stay the same, right? So just as the most obvious example, if the other person got some sort of new evidence, there was actually really good evidence that gave them reasons to change their belief. Then we might say, okay, the process, right? We're concerned in, about the processes that act on political beliefs. The process that we're really interested in here is the resistance of the person who doesn't change to their new evidence. 
when I was in Vienna on Wednesday, uh, Asa Wilkesforce was there who has a, a knowledge resistance project, right? So people, they could know the evidence is right there and they just don't want to know, right? They're resistant to knowing, right? Mm. So we need to, you know, so it, there's a question of, is the process about the person who changed or is it about the person who stayed the same? The conservative wants to say, well, you changed. Of course, you, you're the person who underwent a process, but our beliefs change all the time. You know, we're always getting new evidence about all sorts of beliefs. So we can't take either of these stories necessarily at face value. Well, this one doesn't even have a face value because it's just some weird chart. Um, but we have to do further thinking about who is undergoing a process and what are the relevant processes. Does that make, make sense? So this is the sort of sort of place I'm coming from here. Okay, so different different types of processes. Um, so that's a question about who is affected by the process. I think I go through it again on a later slide. Sorry about that. Um, there's a more abstract question about what, what does a, a political epistemic process affect, right? So I was interested in this normalization thing. Um, normalization, you know, normalizing as a verb used in this way seems to take as its object some phenomena, right? And what happens is, you know, we go, it affects us as a society, and we sort of go from thinking that that phenomenon is, is weird to thinking that that phenomenon is normal. Does that make sense? So that's sort of the object of that process. The object is the phenomenon, or where in some sense it's the, our beliefs about the phenomenon or how, how normal it is, how weird it is, right? Polarization is the process that acts on belief spaces, right? This is actually a lot, a lot of the questions about polarization in the political epistemology literature are only stated by a kind of metonymy, right? So we're constantly asking in political epistemology, is polarization rational? But one person can't polarize by themselves, right? If you ask, is a hallucination rational? There's, there's an epistemic agent who's hallucinating and you can ask sort of, are they, in, are they in the right relationship to their reasons or not, right? Is polarization rational? It's a much stranger question, right? Because polarization is a sort of characteristic of communities who have agents with sets of beliefs that relate to each other in a certain way, right? So in the most obvious case, you know, you know, if you have 50% of the population thinks the tax rate should be 10% and 50% thinks it should be 90%, right? Then it's polarized. The beliefs are pretty far apart. There are two very high peaks. Everybody falls into the two groups, right? You know, generally the more it looks like American politics, the more, the more it looks like polarization, right? <laughs> um, Nobody really thinks it should be, well, I don't think anybody thinks it should be 90%, but there are, you know, there are the, there are people who think it should be 0%. So, um, so that's a process that acts on belief spaces, right? Um, and maybe there's a kind of group polarization. Uh, Cass Sunstein talks about this phenomenon where everybody's on one side of an issue and then they talk to each other, they move, they move even further to one side of that issue. Um, one of the problems with this formulation uh, that I talk about a little bit in the book, you actually need a much larger community to understand what it means to be on a certain side of an issue, right? So when the group that's on the side of the issue deliberates, obviously to be moving to one extreme, they have to understand themselves as in contradistinction to the people who aren't there, you know, who are on the other other side, right? So if if, the, if there weren't a larger community they were they were a part of, then the sides would be split up differently. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay, now radicalization, as Kassam put it, radicalization, much more specific process, much more psychological process, right? At least the way Kassam put it, radicalization, sort of like the process of making somebody into an extremist or giving them extreme beliefs, right? That acts on a single epistemic agent, right? Um, I know nothing about how it works. I'm sure everybody here and watching knows more about that than I do. Um, maybe it involves, you know, shaking your fist at somebody and telling them to believe something until they believe it. Maybe it involves giving them a lot of crazy books or something. Um, but it acts on a, on a specific believer, specific epistemic agent, right? So that's a different target of the political epistemic process. Um, politicization, I don't end up talking about too much. Um, 
but it's a process that acts on beliefs. So a belief can go from being not political to being political to being not political again, based on how it relates to public issues, public discourse. Um, so it can act on beliefs, but not by not by changing them, by changing how they relate to other beliefs. Uh, so does that all make sense? These all seem like processes that have different objects and might relate in strange ways, surprising ways. Hopefully I can say some of the surprising ways. Okay, this is what I already said. I'm just gonna say it again because it's on the side. So there's a question of what, or maybe I should have said who here, who is the political epistemic process relative to, right? Um, descriptive approach, one descriptive approach at least, it's the person who changes, it's just an empirical factor, beliefs change. Normative approach, we have to say, the person whose process we want to examine is the person being irrational. Problem there, we have the issue of building the substantive political epistemology into the structure of what we're trying to study, right? So if we say, we have to know who has good evidence and who doesn't, when we see these beliefs changing, um, then we're in the in the position of maybe saying we have to solve politics before we solve political epistemology. Seems like a difficult ask. Um, might undermine the point of doing political epistemology. I don't know. Different people do political epistemology for different reasons. Some people, you know, Kevin Dorst is somebody who says if we do if we do good political epistemology, you know, it'll make people more agreeable. It'll make them understand how they can treat each other as more rational. But if it turns out that to do political epistemology, we have to start out by actually being doctrinaire about politics, doesn't seem like that would be a likely result, right? Another question, I keep pushing this question back. I think I have something about it on the end. So another question is the philosophy of history question about assessing changes in values, right? Or moral beliefs as a chain, as opposed to uh, you know, non-moral beliefs. Uh, I never know what, as your own knows, I never know exactly what to call them, but factual beliefs, empirical beliefs, right? Um, one thing we were talking about on Wednesday was uh, whether we might need different explanations for value change than belief change. Um, and maybe if you remember Collins, the picture where the person's running off to the left, right? Maybe that's an instance of value change. Um, and that's a little hard to assess, right? Um, then we have to do some hardcore moral epistemology to say, do we have reasons for our moral beliefs? Where do they come from? You know. Um, okay. Okay. So an example quote of places, sort of place where this comes up, right? So Neil Levy, he's arguing about uh, accounts of the irrationality of polarization. He says there's no a priori reason to think that the truth is more likely to lie in the middle of a group, right? prior to their sharing their opinions with another than at the extreme, right? So two sides go to the extremes. Why are we being so mean? You know, maybe one of them is right, right? Um, there's no reason to think some normative claims should be rejected because it was initially held by only a minority of deliberators. Everything depends on the composition of the group. You know, antebellum United States before the Civil War, right? We have slavery. There are extremists against slavery, extremists for slavery. Obviously, we think one of those sides was right, the other one was wrong. There's a few problems with this. Um, we may have some a priori reasons having to do with our social epistemology, right? We might say in general, the middle of the group is pretty reliable because we're conciliationists or because we believe in epistemic democracy or something like that. There's also the issue of using truth uh, to answer a question about rationality. So we might say, yeah, they were, you know, they were right about slavery, but assessing whether they were rational is a different issue. We might need to use different tools to do that. But in general, the point seems like an important one, right? The meta point seems like an important one. The meta point is maybe we need to, maybe we need to have some view about uh, where the two sides end up, right? And the actual truth of those political claims before we accept them, I think. Let's move on from this slide. Let's not wait. Um, right, okay, this is the right meta point. So it's hard to avoid being substantive um, in an even deeper sense, right? I'm glad Enzo's here for this. I'm gonna make Enzo happy a little bit. Um, so two types of political psychology I talk about uh, in the book, but actually I think it applies to political epistemology as well. One is a moderate, you know, you're kind of attempting to characterize the 
these deviations from the norm, right? Again, we're a little bit of the psychology of normalcy and deviance mode, right? Um, I'm often in this mode as a kind of pathological centrist, you know? Um, so why are, why are there these crazy people on the left? Why are there these crazy people on, on the right? Maybe we can come up with some like unified theory of all the people I disagree with on all the extremes and why the people in the center are right about everything, right? Um, so that's one approach to political epistemology. Um, and it seems like if you even start with that approach, you, you know, you have some background belief likely about the rationality of the system you're living in, the goodness of the system you're living in. Radical political epistemology, in some ways an older tradition of political epistemology, right? It goes back to, I don't know, Marx at least, right? Um, attempts to do something very different, right? In radical political epistemology, we think there's something wrong with the mainstream. We think there's something wrong with the system or the society. Um, and so we're going to doubt the, the range of acceptable belief. Rather than explaining why do people go outside the range of acceptable belief, we're going to say, why is that even the range of acceptable belief? Why are people so blinkered, right? Uh, my friend Liam Bright, in reading something I wrote a while ago, he said, it's interesting we have these different goals. You're trying to explain why people disagree about politics. I'm trying to explain why people agree about politics, right? Um, so why is there such consensus uh, the radical says on such horrible things, you know, on such a bad system? Why are people willing to agree about this and why do they not want to change it? So those are two very different goals and it seems like we arrive at those different goals based on substantive political belief. Um, and so for a radical political epistemologist, we may, I don't know if that's exactly what I want to say. We, we, we may need to posit a process of becoming normal, you know, in quotes, bad normal, right? Just as we process, posit a process for the moderate, we posit a process of becoming abnormal. Um, and the process of becoming normal could be ideology, propaganda, could be socialization, you know, um, people have posited these processes, but it's a different sort of process. It's a different sort of a process. Um, oh, I'm using the phrase Overton window here. Sorry. Another American thing. Overton window, some guy named Overton came up with this idea. It just means the range of acceptable belief. Um, I think he originally introduced it specifically to mean the things politicians are willing to say. If you go outside it, it'll, it'll damage your electoral chances, right? Um, originally, he meant there to be a contrast between what politicians can say and what, say, a political commentator who's not running for office or somebody in a think tank might say. So the idea was, if you're if you're not a politician, but you're involved in politics, you can sort of move the Overton window by being convincing or by being kind of wild, putting something into the, into the mainstream of the flow. Um, Yeah, so this this last question, I don't know if it's so deep, I shouldn't have written the word deep, but there's a question about which which political beliefs actually are acceptable. I think I was thinking about this because I was talking about about Trump with somebody. So Trump said a lot of things uh, that I uh, in the 2016 election that I think were generally taken to be outside of the range of, you know, what, what somebody running for president can say. And he won, right? So one thing we might say is just like he was right and they were wrong. Um, but it's an interesting fact, right? If the if the actual range of acceptable political opinion is kind of difficult to figure out, um, well, that's an interesting fact at least. Probably not a deep one, but an interesting. <clears throat> okay, so so some challenges to moderate political epistemology. I'm doing okay on time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and these are challenges to me, right? Like I said, th these are I'm not trying to challenge anybody else here. It's just a record of failure, right? Um, so the conservative challenge. Uh, right, standing to thwart history, yelling stop, like I said. The range of acceptable political beliefs changes. Uh, so the topic of moderate political epistemology changes as well, right? We might think that this is this is an oddity, right? In the year 1950, if I'm a moderate political epistemologist, I'm trying to explain how do people deviate from the norm? I'm looking at certain sets of political beliefs. In the year 2024, as a moderate political epistemologist, I'm asking how do people, why would people deviate from the norm? What sorts of processes are occurring? Looking at a very different set of political beliefs, right? This could be resolved again if we if we think really hard about what were the reasons for these changes, right? Were there good reasons for these changes? Maybe the 2024 moderate political epistemologist is in 
a better position than the 1950 political epistemologists. Maybe they've, they've made progress in political epistemology by making progress in politics. Um, but it's another place where we have to evaluate the issues directly, right? We have to look directly at what reasons there were for changes, philosophy of history, and what evidence people might have. Um, right, so the potential solution, um, another potential solution, we avert to processes, um, and we sort of start by defining, here are the processes we're interested in, right? Here are the processes that tend to produce beliefs outside the norm, conspiracy theories, other kinds of radicalization, right? Um, and then we can say, well, those are the things we're talking about. Um, but methodologically, I don't think that works um, just because generally the way we, we do things is by looking at people who have beliefs that we see as being outside the norm and then trying to explain how they got them rather than observing directly that they went through some process and then you know, then it's sort of epiphenomenal that it spat out some belief. Um, so I think this is a real challenge. Um, the other challenge, the radical debunking challenge, right? Um, the range of acceptable, maybe this was already there in just contrasting the two views, but the range of acceptable political belief is going to be convenient for the ruling, ruling regime, right? It's acceptable for a reason, for the, for the radical, right? Um, the radical thinks it's acceptable for a reason. Um, the regime may be able to marginalize people who don't believe as they want. So Chomsky on U.S. foreign policy, you know, he says it's not so much that I don't know if he's, uh, you know, within the intelligent intelligentsia. He's not always giving like a propagandistic theory. Often he's saying something like, well, you don't even you don't even get a job if you believe contrary to the establishment. Right. So sort of within the foreign party party foreign policy establishment you already sort of have to be selected for having certain beliefs. So of course, all the experts end up with certain beliefs because that's how we decide whether or not they're experts, right? Just by the set of beliefs they started with. Um, so that's the sort of radical challenge we're worried about. Um, and it's sort of comparable to these relativity challenges about conspiracy, the rationality of conspiracy theories. The relative, relativity challenges about conspiracy theories basically are just that different things might count as conspiracy theories in different places, right? You know, um, if you're in country A and you say country B attacked us and therefore, you know, we're gonna go to war with them. You're in country B, you say country A, uh, we didn't attack country A, that's a conspiracy theory and they're going to war with us for our oil or something like that. Well, if it, you know, if what counts as a conspiracy theory is relative to sort of something about what country you're in, which actually there are theories of conspiracy theories that say that it is, it's relative to an official story. Um, then people in different places, you know, the same belief may count as a conspiracy theory in one place and not in another, right? Um, so same sort of challenge. Okay, so what is in the Overton window? I wanted to give a little bit of an account of which beliefs are actually normal, what normalization actually is. Um, so there's a sort of linear view. Um, I don't like it, I think just because it's boring, um, <laughs> but it might be right. The linear view is just sort of like, yeah, we, we can have like a left-right spectrum and the Overton window is sort of like a, like sort of the middle of that spectrum. It can shift, but it sort of excludes the extremes, right? Um, in some sense. Um, yeah, I think I don't like this view because it's boring. Um, I'm also never sure that we can map Every political belief onto a left-right spectrum. Um, not always clear to me that left and right mean anything. You know, in the U.S., left basically means vaguely associated with the Democratic Party, and right means vaguely associated with the Republican Party. Again, told you very odd background dynamics in the U.S. Um, so that's a linear view of what we count as a range of acceptable discourse right over over the window. Um, one thing I one thing I talk about in the book is this idea of a sacral view, sacral, sacral, um, has to do with the notion of sacredness and taboos. Um, so Philip Tetlock talks about uh, sort of normal values and, and sacred values. Sacred values are the ones that we sort of react very negatively when they're, when they're put into some sort of uh, like utilitarian trade-off, right? 
Um, there's, some people react very badly even to like a, a trolley problem. You know, why are you why are you playing God by deciding that one person should die to make five people live? That's like not up to you to decide, right? So often if somebody says that's not up to you to decide, it's because the value is somehow sacred to them. Um, so Overton window may have something to do with uh, are the values considered sacred or not, right? Um, if the values are considered sacred, then manipulating them, trading them off against one another is not going to be within the realm of acceptable discourse. That could probably use a little bit more specification that day. Um, and then the process view, which I was thinking about because I'm thinking about processes for this talk, um, we might be able to say that uh, the range of acceptable discourse uh, is sort of relative to processes, right? We might be able to say the range of acceptable discourse has something to do with which processes are taken to explain which beliefs. Um, and this is something that I actually think we do see in a lot of public discourse and in the American context. Um, so a belief that might be kind of well, in, in some sense, in the center of, of political discourse, but that somebody gives a convincing explanation that the background process that produced this belief is bad in some way, that belief can then can then be have, have trouble, right, in terms of being acceptable. Um, so beliefs that are somehow biased, racist beliefs, sexist beliefs, um, beliefs that are susceptible to some sort of psychological diagnosis that seem like the result of paranoia or something like that, or beliefs that fit one of these standard stories of irrationality and political epistemology like conspiracy theories. Um, so those might be the sorts of things that end up being abnormal, that end up being removed from the normalized set of political beliefs, right? Um, certainly a lot of the, you know, just thinking to the normalizing, normalizing Trump articles, um, a lot of the debate was based around, you know, why would Trump be saying something like this? What sort of background process is in his head? Is he a racist? Is he a sexist? And so on, right? Okay, I should speak up a little. Um, okay. So a puzzle about normalization and radicalization. Actually, as I, as I was walking around today, I realized we don't even really need normalization for this puzzle. Um, but OK, so if beliefs are normalized through a process that acts on the belief space or society in general or something, but epistemic agents are the object of radicalization, which produces extreme beliefs, um, you can have a political belief that's simultaneously extreme and normal, um, right? Because the epistemic agent has gone through a psychological process which produces this belief, and then there's a process that normalizes it, right? Um, perhaps equivalently, right, um, if beliefs are radicalized through a process that acts on the psychology of an epistemic agent, but the set of normal beliefs changes over time, then a radical belief can, can turn into a normal one, right? So the way to say this without even talking about normalization, which, you know, nobody else is talking about but me, so it's probably good to be able to say in some other ways, basically, you know, imagine somebody's belief is radicalized. Somebody's radicalized so that they have an extreme political belief, right? <clears throat> but then a whole lot of other people are radicalized. We might think if we're thinking extensionally about what counts as extreme, you know, based on how many people agree, how many adherents does this belief have or something, um, then a whole lot of radicalization leads to the belief not being extreme anymore. Um, so that would undercut another, th you know, another way to say it is this might undercut the relationship between radicalization and extreme beliefs. Um, if we think about radicalization acting on the belief space on a whole set of believers, as opposed to just one believer, right? I don't know. It looks like people, it looks like that's, that's not making sense to people, but you can explain why. Um, okay. Okay. So this is sort of what I was talking about at the beginning. Um, some unsatisfying possibilities. Um, so just like epistemology has to start somewhere, maybe political epistemology has to start somewhere, um, maybe with some foundation of political beliefs. That would solve some of these problems, right? Um, if, to begin with, we sort of have some sense of which beliefs, which political beliefs are incontrovertible and which political beliefs are sort of incontro incontrovertibly odd. Um, then we can, we can build a lot out of that, right? We already know this is an extreme belief. Um, we don't have to look at how many people hold it. We don't have to look at how it was produced and we can sort of build out what are the normal beliefs, what are the extreme beliefs, which processes do we need to explain what from there. Um, 
this is already a little unsatisfying to me. I would prefer to get all the substantive politics out of political epistemology if I can, probably impossible. Even worse is the nothing but politics stance, which is basically, you don't just need to start with substantive political beliefs, but kind of every time you do political epistemology, you need to make some evaluation about political beliefs, um, which political beliefs you think are true and false. Um, but both of these stances suggest that to some degree or another, it's difficult to do convincing political epistemology across substantive political disagreements. I take it that this would be, this would be bad. This would make me unhappy at least. Um, I think I put these slides maybe in the wrong order, but yeah, so, okay. So I'm finally talking about philosophy of history. This is one way that I think we can do better. That's the context. One way I think we can do a little better. Um, philosophy of history, if we, you know, if we figure out answers in the philosophy of history, we can we can get some much broader assessments of political belief change and of changes in values, right? So if if it's like, you know, if somebody actually convinces me that we're we're making moral progress, that's just the way the world works, right? We make we make moral progress just like we make scientific progress, then we can have answers about some of these things, right? We can say, you know, as the as the person moves one way and I stay the same. If a lot of people are moving with them and I'm staying the same, then I'm the one we need to explain, right? I'm the one whose resistance we need to explain. The people who are moving, they're just sort of moving with the flow of history. We've decided history is good. It makes progress. Um, so I'm the one who needs to be explained there if we have that view. On the other hand, if we have a conservative view of the philosophy of history, we might take the opposite idea. I have a parabolic view of the philosophy of history, which is that history peaked in the 1990s, but we don't need to talk about that. Um, this has to do with like which movies were good and stuff like that. Um, epistemology is really done with the philosophy of history in mind. Basically, nobody does philosophy of history anymore, but they certainly haven't done it with modern tools of epistemology. Um, there's a lot of th good things that I think could be could come from you know marrying these two subfields. Um, for example, questions about moral progress. Uh, there's a lot of hardcore contemporary moral epistemology these days. Um, questions about expertise. Um, for a while, I was working on a paper about uh, is it is it uh, coherent to treat somebody from the future as a moral expert um, relative to yourself? And it has to do with questions about recognizing ex experts to begin with, questions uh, from social epistemology. Um, I can talk more about that. That would have been cool to present here, too. Um, so, but overall, some more satisfying possibilities. Um, here's sort of the way I think we, we should be going um, rather than, you know, just accepting that we have to do politics, do political epistemology. Here are some alternate ideas. Um, yeah, try to, this one, who knows if, if this will be possible, but try to do something general um, that maybe gives us an account of moderate and extreme beliefs at the same time. So we don't need to take a stance on the moderate radical question. Maybe there will be some more general account um, having to do with social identity or having to do with incentives, whatever it is. Um, but rather than saying, you know, here are the good guys, here are the bad guys, and I only need to explain the bad guys, try to explain everybody at once, that might be too big an ask, but if somebody can do it, that would be the ideal, I think. Um, Try to come up with an account of belief change with long reach. Um, so, you know, a lot of the pro processes we talk about are sort of like, you know, how did somebody go from being a normal person to being a QAnon supporter in like a year? Um, and that's a different kind of question from like, how did the society of 1900 turn into the society of 2000? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the former question is very interesting. There's a lot of great work being done on it. Latter question, I think, also bears on, on political epistemology. Um, try to address value change with the tools of moral epistemology. I was just talking about that. Um, try to disentangle these different processes. I started to, but I'm sure I made a ton of mistakes. Um, and think about different levels. What acts on a person? What acts on their beliefs? What acts on sets of beliefs? What acts on society? What acts on propositions? Things like that. Um, and yeah, try to come, with, come up with accounts of key terms so that when we state, when we talk about these different processes, we're, so, we're not like running into problems where maybe we use a word like normal or extreme or radical and it means different things and 
uh, in different accounts, um, try to come with a you know unified vocabulary for, for these different problems. Um, I don't know. I think these things would, would be helpful. Probably a lot of people are already doing some of them, maybe people here. Um, but those are my reflections on political processes and my record of failure in coming up with my own theory of political beliefs. So thank you, everybody. Uh, hopefully it made some sense.